Today, I want to talk about uh, should you bend your spine? This is a, a common question um, that I get asked. It's also a very common comment that I get from a certain population online. Um, um, the first thing I want to say is that you should bend your spine. You can bend your spine. It just depends when you're doing it, who's doing it, what exercise is being used when you're doing it. So there's some, some caveats. It's not just a simple, it's a natural movement. Your spine can bend. You should bend it, therefore. Because if you're doing a heavy deadlift, please don't bend your spine because it's going to break it. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go through this. So with regards to should you bend your spine? Yes, you can. It just depends when and how and what with regards to the exercise that you're doing. So I have done um, a previous video about this um, where I was in the gym demonstrating various bits. Uh, but what I'm going to do today is just kind of go through some of the some of the information that, that comes from that video and just talk about it and hopefully bring some bring it to life a little bit with some um, examples. Now, with regards to, um, I suppose, where a lot of this comes from, you can just see over my shoulder there, um, you've got back disorder, and then next to it, which you probably can't see, um, is ultimate back fitness and performance. So this is sort of derived from those books, from Dr. McGill, but there are also some um, sort of anatomical parts that I'm going to add in that I've just kind of gleaned and understood as we go. So the first part is about spine power or what he describes as spine power. Now, basically spine power is generating the movement from the spine. Now, if, there, if, if you are generating movement from the spine and then you are loading it so you have um like i do in the in the video i have a cable machine and i'm stood with the cable machine and i've got the handle here and i sort of twist my spine so generating the movement from my spine moving the handle across my body that would be known as a high spine power and a high spine power can increase risk of deterioration or injury or problems within the spine and I'll come on to that a bit later. So high spine power isn't necessarily that much of an advantageous thing so that's high load and um, uh, movement. Now you can sort of describe like a low spine power so for example if there is very little load so if I am stood or sat here like this and I do the exact same movement but without the load so I've got the so before I had the cable and I was twisting my spine across like this that would be known as a high spine power because of the, the high load now if I just sit here and turn my spine like that that isn't high spine power because I've taken the load out but I can twist my spine it's the same inflection. If you go into a squat and you go down into the squat and then you go all the way down or you go down far enough that your spine starts to flex and bend, that will be known as a high spine power because you've got movement and it's loaded. Now, if I go with a bodyweight squat and I go down into a bodyweight squat, which does happen with me, if I go down and basically just sit in a full squat at the bottom, I've got a flex spine. But because of there, of there being such little load going through the spine, it's not going to have that much of an adverse effect because the load will speed the problem up. Now, the, the next caveat comes with, do you have a healthy spine or not? If you have a healthy spine and if you have a healthy and fit spine, let's say, so the when you look at the so if you had an mri scan or an x-ray and you looked at the structures of the spine it was all in good condition then you can get away with it more than if you've got a bad spine so if you were to look at an x-ray or an mri scan and you can see all these bits and pieces the you know 
disc deterioration, vertebra deterioration, whatever it is in there, you're going to be, it's going to be more advantageous to not bend the spine as much. Again, everyday life, you're going to do it. That's just going to happen. So you can't get away from it. What you've got to be able to do is minimize how much it can be done. So by bending the spine under load is only going to add to a problem that could already be there. If you've got a healthy spine, bending the spine under load could take you towards that problem. And we'll talk about how that can do it in a second. So what we've got to understand are the caveats and the nuances in information or the nuances in practice and the practicalities of bending the spine and keeping the spine healthy and keeping the spine injured. So there is nothing wrong with bending the spine. It just depends how, when, and what you're doing. So we have to understand that. So, so how do we go about doing exercise or doing movement without causing that much of a problem to the spine? Well, the first thing is rotate and flex at the hip. So going into that cable, that, that sort of chopping movement, that cable movement, don't rotate from the spine, rotate from the hip. Same with the squat. As you go down into the squat, you want to get the flexion from the hip and you allow the hip flexion whilst maintaining the neutral lumbar posture. That dictates how far down you can go. If then you can improve the range of movement of your hip, and you can get down further, then you can go down further. But you you don't let the spine bend. This is if you're loading it. Now, if you can get down into a full body squat without flexing your spine, then perfect. But part of that can be determined by the structure of the hip. So again, even with um, body weight squatting, people can have great ankle range of movement, great hip range of movement, but they still can't get all the way down because it because of limb length. It could be the length of your femur, could be the length of your tibia. So all these different things can impact on the biomechanics. And these are the things that we have to understand as well. It's not only the, the sort of the structure of the hip, the limb length, so on and so forth. So there's all these different types of caveats and nuances. As you sort of layer in, it's you can't just throw a broad brush across you can flex your spine because do you know if there's a disc bulge? Do you know if there's facet joint inflammation? Do you know if there's um, a sort of arthritic bone spur type structures going around the vertebral body? There's all these different types of stuff. And that doesn't mean just by being pain free because being pain free doesn't tell you enough about the spine to essentially be um, for it to be healthy is what I'm trying to say. So the, the biomechanics influences how the spine um, um, is, is made up, if you will. So what that means is biomechanics can cause injuries to the spine. So flexing the spine can cause injuries to the spine. Twisting the spine can cause injury to the spine. So just because it's not painful doesn't mean there's no injury there yet. Because, again, if you read this type of book, and if you read many types of books, Achilles tendon ruptures is another one. Achilles tendon ruptures, people think it's that one moment where the Achilles tendon ruptures like that. It's not. If, if, you, if you read the literature, what, what tends to be found is there are a lot of what is called micro traumas in the Achilles, and then the one where it goes is just the tipping point. So... It wasn't that one mo that one moment that was the problem. It was all the poor movement or the lack of recovery that built up to that one moment. And then that one moment gave you the problem. That's the same in the shoulder injuries with uh, shoulder impingement. It's the lifting of the elbow above the shoulder when it's internally rotated, which is slamming the supraspinatus muscle into, um, uh, into the AC joint. And then eventually it creates inflammation. So it wasn't the one moment that did it. It was the build-up of the constant poor positioning and lack of recovery 
that caused the problem, but it didn't give you the pain until the moment where it hit over the tipping point. So it's all these different types of things that you need to understand when it comes to should you bend your spine, because you have to understand, first of all, you have to understand like the mechanics of the spine, then you have to understand the mechanics of injury to the spine, and that's just learning the knowledge. Then you have to understand about your spine, your biomechanics, mechanics of your hips, mechanics of your spine, if it's squatting, mechanics of your ankle as well, understanding your type of limb, limb length, which could limit how far down you can go, so on and so forth. So there's all these different types of things you have to learn when it comes to should you bend your spine or not. The next thing, if we just look at basic anatomy of the hip and of the spine. So if we go to the spine, the spine is known as a slightly movable joint, which is a cartilaginous joint. Now, as it describes, a cartilaginous joint is a slightly movable joint and it doesn't move. So each segment doesn't move that much, but a, a small amount of movement over many segments creates a lot of movement. So it sort of gives the illusion that there's a lot of movement at the spine, but it's actually lots of small bits of movement. So you've then got the, the vertebra and the disc, the vertebra of the disc, and that builds up. That's known as your cartilaginous joint, your slightly movable joint. What we've then got, if we then go out a layer and we just start to bring in the muscles, if we go to the deepest layer of the muscles, they are, uh, they have a lot of nerve endings in them. So they're all about the position of the spine. They're not, you don't make them strong. It's all about postural um, positioning and proprioception. If we then go out a layer and you start to get to sort of like the erector spinae group, yes, I will agree, they can extend the spine, but that is not their role to do that. They are, if if I could describe it, I don't know, properly, it would be a, um, a static contraction muscle. So what they're doing is if you had the spine and it was, so that's an upright spine, obviously it doesn't have to contract as much to hold the spine up. But as soon as you come over into a horizontal position or a sort of a 45 degree angle position, the muscles will start to turn on to hold the spine in place. So essentially they're holding it up. Not literally, but because there's so many structures in there, but essentially what they're doing is they're they are contracting statically to hold the spine in position. So we have the neutral spine, and what we know about the neutral spine is that when load is put on the spine in the neutral position, is it's dispersed evenly throughout the vertebra. When we go out of that neutral position, it starts to concentrate in certain areas, so you have an excess and a deficiency of load going in certain areas. Whereas when it's in neutral, it's more evenly distributed. So again, the stress on the spine is, is a little bit less. What we then have is, so we've got the, we've got the structures of the spine, um, the vertebra and the discs, which only move a little bit. We've got the muscles, which are static contractors. If you, again, if you go back to this book, it will be said that, um, uh, that what the muscles are there to do is to hold the spine in place. And when we go out of neutral, those muscles can't function properly. So you get shearing forces. So anterior shearing forces, again, I've explained this before, where it's sort of an anterior shear, if this is the front of the spine, it falls off the front. So those muscles basically neutralize that force and hold it in position. When you go into a flex spine, they don't have the ability or they don't have as good ability to be able to do that essentially so again it's understanding all of these types of things so there's this that's a basic understanding of the anatomy of the spine let's now go to the hips the hips is then um what's known as a, a freely movable joint so a ball and socket joint freely movable lots of range of movement because it's the ball that sits in the socket and it can move in loads of different positions and ideally the same as the shoulder it can move in um, greater positions it's more stable than the shoulder because the 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 socket that it sits in is a lot deeper so it's a lot more stable as a joint just structurally because of the depth of the um well again that depends that's a part of the the structure of the hip do you have a deep hip socket or a shallow hip socket 
and that obviously then adds to the stability of that joint but it's a freely movable joint so even just looking at the joints we can start to see we've got a freely movable joint in the hip versus a slightly movable joint at the spine so which one should we be moving from or primarily moving from it's going to be the hips because that's the freely movable joint which has the greater range of movement if we then go out and we look at the muscles what muscles have we got there we've got glute max now glute max is a very powerful a very strong muscle we're, we're putting glute max versus erector spinae group which is going to be the stronger muscle it's going to be the uh, glute max which is going to generate the more power it's going to be the glute max so everything with regards to movement is pointing at the hips so yes the spine can move and it can move in certain scenarios and it will be better to move in certain scenarios from the spine but when it comes to exercise and loading it's going to be more advantageous to load the hip maintain the posture of the spine and then drive through the hips drive through the quads if we're squatting and so on and so forth so we have to understand it in that regard now i've talked a lot about or partly about injury but what we are talking about so if we take that rotation movement that i was doing with the with the cable and high load now the rotation movement of a segment will do what's known as delaminate a disc again comes from these books behind me um, now delamination so if you can imagine like rings of a tree is you've got a jelly-like fluid in the middle and then you've got all these rings that go out now they're tightly packed so when it starts to delaminate the this tightly packed layering or rings around the jelly-like fluid will start to reduce and then that allows um, that allows the fluid to start to migrate through the spine and then it can eventually create disc bulge disc herniations so on and so forth what it can also do is create disc laxity so it can just make a disc more lax and create instability through the segment of vertebra disc in between and then vertebra on the top so it can just become more lax which then can then turn into instability in the spine and then um, muscle like spasming to try and catch and bring stability to the area so you can start to see in patterns of what people are talking about what potentially is the problem within the spine that could be happening so it's trying to understand sort of from both angles if you've got imaging of the spine and then if you've got experience of movement and experience and pain patterns you can start to put the two together and it starts to give you a complete picture you can start to understand it from one and from the other and in some respects movement will probably give you a better story um, but having both of them is going to be advantageous so you get disc bulges and this is the same from um, uh, uh, flexion as well so as I mentioned in a neutral posture the um, the load is distributed evenly across the spine so let's just say front back left and right it's distributed evenly as soon as you go into a flexed it's going to it's going to put more pressure on the back of the of the disc and it's going to start pushing the fluid towards the back that then again over time so you won't get the pain straight away over time you will start to get the pain um, that will come from the disc bulging and touching a nerve and things like that so you can start to see and start to build a picture of should you bend your spine first of all it just comes down to the health of the spine second of all it comes down to loading of the spine it comes down to everyday movements it comes down to everyday postures and things like that so you can start to see should you the question was at the start should you bend your spine it depends on so many factors so for someone to come along and just broad brush and say yes you should bend your spine it's a natural part of your movement if you've got a history of back spasms or if you've got a history of disc herniations or bulges then it's probably not going to be advantageous to go about actively bending your spine it will have a use and it will have to be used in certain aspects of life that absolutely fine i completely understand that but going out and saying you need to load your spine with an exercise and then flex it 
that's probably not the most advantageous thing to do when that's the exact mechanism that causes the problem in the first place. So it's understanding these types of things and another one is just the because you've then got you could then add another layer in disk shape that creates um, um, uh, or that influences when a disk will bulge and disk will hone it. You know, there's so many places you can go down and understanding these different variables that will um, that will influence should you bend your spine or not and hopefully from just from this that I'm doing now you're starting to understand it's like oh maybe I shouldn't do it then but if I do it then it's okay that's that's a better way of thinking not just listening to people saying these people that talk about maintaining neutral spine they're idiots and they don't know what they're talking about it's about understanding the variables and understanding when you can and when you can't um, or when is more advantageous and when is less advantageous to bend a spine. It's understanding things like that. And if you can start to do that, you're going to be in a much better place. So I haven't covered everything with regards to the mechanics of a spine and should you bend your spine or should you not. But hopefully I've given you enough food for thought to first of all understand that when you see and hear people say broad brush bend your spine it's good for you it's a natural movement that there's a little bit more to it and you may want to ask them some questions about but my spine's like this I've got a history of that so on and so forth I've got these pain patterns blah 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 blah, blah. so you've got all those different things because they may not understand that they may just come from a, a natural movement philosophy that they think this is what you need to do and this is how you need to go about doing it but hopefully I've given you enough food for thought to think, well, maybe in this scenario, I'll maintain a neutral spine. And in this scenario, I'll be able to bend my spine and it won't have as bad of an effect. So obviously I haven't answered the question completely for everyone, but hopefully I've given you enough food for thought to think, yeah, maybe I do need to think about when I bend my spine and when I don't bend my spine.